Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for the fourth issue briefing of this afternoon's uh, summit on the Global Agenda Day 2. This one is particularly interesting and particularly relevant um, for the, 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 the venue here, Abu Dhabi. It's on the future of cities, and I can't think of a more um, future-facing city than our host here in the UAE. Now, 2 billion extra people will be living in the world's cities by 2050, the UN believes, and not our numbers. What's quite clear is if that m migration is going to uh, be managed in an efficacious way, then lots of work needs to be done, not in terms of planning, in terms of building up city economies. So I'm very glad to be joined here by two experts in these respective fields. I'm going to waste no more time introducing myself, but I will introduce them briefly and then ask them to make some opening remarks. I'm joined by Susan Zielinski, Managing Director of SMART uh, at the University of Michigan in the USA, an urban planner. Rosine Sally is Associate Professor of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore and a member of our Global Agenda Council on Competitiveness. Done uh, quite a bit of work studying um, city economies over the past. Rosine, perhaps we can start with you. And what, what is your sense of the evolution of the city as an economic motor in its own right, and uh, pulling away from the nation state perhaps, or becoming an, you know, an independent entity? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I mean, it's always been important. And uh, before the age of uh, nation states, the so-called Westphalian sit uh, system uh, in, in Europe and in other parts of the world, um, <clears throat> governance was really a matter of cities uh, or of city regions. Uh, we tend to forget that in the age of the nation state. Uh, it's becoming even more important because of this mega trend of urbanization that we have in the 21st century. So uh, what is it? About 50% of the world's population live in cities, but they account for about 80% of, uh, of the world's output. 60% uh, of uh, uh, China will be urban in 2020 or thereabouts. Um, so in that sense, cities are becoming more important. And cities are becoming especially more important outside the West because the projections are that of the urbanization that we're going to see over the next few decades, about 90 to 95% of it is going to happen outside the West. Um, and uh, the really big growth is going to come in, uh, in what McKinsey Global Institute calls middleweight cities, cities with a population of between 5 and 10 million, where we're going to see a much bigger emerging market middle class uh, and we're going to see higher levels of growth uh, than, uh, than, than we do in uh, existing megacities, cities with a population of 10 million or above. Uh, so for all those reasons, cities are uh, not only becoming more important as economic actors, but also as political actors, uh, how they're governed, uh, how they plug into the world economy. What are city economies doing right and economies doing wrong in general? What, what would you like to see as an academic studying the competitiveness of cities? What, what kind of best practices are many cities missing out on? Well, uh, uh, my, my council, we, we, we did a report on the competitiveness of cities last year. Uh, it's on the forum website. Uh, we covered about 35 case studies, some big cases, some smaller cases. And we, we had a simple taxonomy. So we looked at... <coughs> uh, the policies that regulate the business climate in these cities, firstly. Second, we, we looked at uh, the institutions of the city, in other words, the decision-making framework. Thirdly, the hard infrastructure, you know, roads, rail, ports, airports. And fourthly, a bit more difficult, the soft infrastructure or connectivity, uh, including the digital economy. So we use those four, four pillars and also how they come together to assess how cities are doing. And our case studies are a mixture of uh, those that have been rip-roaring successes, uh, like Singapore and Dubai, uh, those that have been failures, uh, perhaps like Chandigarh in, uh, in, in India, which was terribly overplanned, um, uh, those that have succumbed to urban sprawl because they haven't got uh, the governance and the infrastructure right, uh, all the way to those that have hit rock bottom and are attempting a turnaround. Detroit is one of our big cases. Uh, and the jury is out on Detroit because uh, it has hit rock bottom. It's only attempted the turnaround just in the last few years. So we'll see. Um, and we also point to, to cities that um, are 
good or best practice examples of genuine innovation. There are several in the United States that were um, industrial cities uh, that, uh, that grew big and strong in the 19th century and then went into post-industrial decline, but which have found their niches in all kinds of new, mainly services activities, uh, as a means of regenerating themselves. I believe Anil Menon from Cisco, who's a member of our Future of Cities Council, wrote a blog saying, uh, claiming that he, he believed that Kansas City was one of his favorite um, smart cities of the future. Hmm. Just, to, just to put that one out there. Um, now, Susan, plenty of ways to bring you in. But before I do, if I may, let's just stick on the urban, uh, the, the urban vision from the economic perspective. In Africa, we're seeing a decoupling from industrialization and urbanization for the first time. Is this, a, is this, is this sustainable? Or is it something that African cities, for example, need to get an industrial policy? Well, um, I, I'm generally a skeptic on the kind of industrial policy where you, uh, or where government believing it's more intelligent than market actors themselves, pick certain sectors and say, you know, we're going to target these for success. Because that kind of industrial policy is littered with failures all over the world. The best industrial policy uh, in my book is uh, is, is, is policy that provides an enabling framework for the whole economy. Uh, and then you'll see how the market evolves and you'll have different outcomes in different places. Um, Africa has a problem when it comes to industrialization because it's abundant in land, it's abundant in natural resources, but uh, uh, it's not abundant in people, not compared with Asia. Uh, at least that's the, that's the historical record. So East and South Asia uh, have done well and are doing well by taking poor people from the countryside and putting them into manufacturing jobs in urbanizing areas. Now that hasn't happened to Africa so far. So Africa has concentrated on other things like resources, bits and pieces of services increasingly. But uh, Africa is probably going to be the biggest beneficiary of this so-called demographic dividend in this century. So Africa is going to become much more populated. Uh, and as Africa becomes more peopled, um, looking beyond the medium term, uh, we may actually see a continent that might be able to specialize profitably in manufacturing, starting at the lower end, as parts of Asia vacate the lower end of manufacturing because their real incomes are rising. We're already seeing this in, in much of East Asia, including China today. So that may be Africa's future, but it's not inevitable. It depends on getting the policies right and getting the institutions right and correcting you know, the very large deficits in both compartments that exist to date. Susan, Rosine was talking about sprawl being an, an unsavory and unsuccessful mm -hmm. characteristic of a, of a modern city. As an urban planner, What's your, what's your vision of a, of a successful, smart city? Uh, well, my focus is on transportation, or sort of the urban mobility space. And I think we're in one of the most exciting times we've been in in a long, long time. I mean, we have urbanization, and everyone's worried about the huge um, sort of crowding in cities. But I think what that's done for us is it's given us this great gift of having to think differently and think smarter used to be that we could think, oh, well, I'll just get a Prius or I'll just get alternative fuel car and then I can move farther and farther and farther away and continue the sprawling pattern that, that has been set up, at least in North America and also in some other parts of the world. But now we have this great opportunity to combine the urbanization. In the US, it's also 80%, I think, and, and uh, I think China as well, 80% um, urban, or at least urban region. and. The, uh, the mobility around that um, is, is mainly car-based in the US. And I think what we've got is the situation of um, urbanization coupled with digital technology that allows for a much greater, more nimble, more door-to-door, -door, multimodal, IT-enabled transport system that doesn't require so much bricks and mortar. It doesn't require such huge kind of capital funding. It says, ah, how can we First of all, look at what we already have. Look at the system that's already connecting. What kinds of multimodal system do we have? And then how do we build on that? How do we identify the gaps? How do we move from there? So one of the things we've done to, I don't know, 
understand the complex system of mobility plus this new solution space around new services, new business models, new products, new modes of transportation, and how they connect together as a whole with the user in mind. And we've been able to sort of begin to understand, well, what's your system? How do we add things, not even necessarily in terms of a master plan, which is sort of like a finite game. A master plan is something that you often think of as, okay, we're gonna get that master plan done, and then it's gonna be finished. Then by this year, it'll be a perfect transportation system or a perfect design. But that's not the way, I mean, basically policies out, sorry, technology's outpacing policy, especially in the transportation realm. So what this also means is because we don't know what we don't know, we have to actually develop these cross-sectoral alliances. We have to be working with each other. And so in, in, when we, in every city we've gone to, we bring together people across the different sectors that are related to transportation. And it's many more than you think normally. I mean, you think, okay, well, it must be the planners and mm -hmm. maybe some infrastructure folks, but actually it's a huge uh, industry cluster, the new mobility industry cluster that's grown out of this sort of shift this sort of industrial shift. So what we've got is not only manufacturing, but also you know, transit, energy, real estate, tourism, um, economic development, um, finance, and then all of these disruptive new mobility um, enterprises, the Ubers, the, the apps, the um, car share, the bike share, um, and a whole bunch of informal um, transportation op opportunities that are being linked in with the rest of the system in a door-to-door -door way. So I think this kind of, um, let's say this nimbleness is spilling over into the sort of more policy-heavy uh, countries and teaching us um, how we can maybe look at how we experiment with certain things, how we put things in place, how we pilot um, integrated systems linking all the different modes across. And you know, I guess one of my favorite sort of frameworks for this is there's a person named James Kars who um, talks about finite and infinite games. And finite games are played with the purpose of winning, and infinite games are playing the play. And I think with transportation, it's something where we continually have to have the alliances there so that when the next Uber-like thing comes along and confuses us from a policy point of view, from a social equity point of view, we're able to immediately know who we can work with, what kinds of immediate sort of technology support solutions to put in, and what kinds of things we have to look at in the long term. What are the... Um business models that you're most excited about. Let's put Uber to one side, because we understand Uber. I think we just, I've just about got my head around it. Um, <laughs> what else, I mean, you study this area. It's a limo company, basically. <laughs> yes, it's a limo company. It's and not it's, really it, the most innovative. It, even, yeah, exactly, it even works in Geneva. <laughs> what else is exciting you in this space? Um, well, to me, the most, you know, it's fairly obvious from what I've just said, the most exciting um, business models is what takes us from mode to system. Right. Mm -hmm. So what we had before is the information technology explosion went from, it's not exactly typewriter to, um, you know, laptop, desktop, printer, camera, all these things working in a customized way in an interoperable way. But there are now business models. One of them is called mobility as a service. We used to call it new mobility industry or new mobility in general. But now mobility as a service has taken off. And um, so, for example, um, we gave an award. We have something called the Moby Prize, which we award entrepreneurs uh, that are in new mobility and doing really cool stuff. But then we thought, actually, we should award cities and states that are incenting. They're doing what you're doing in terms of competitiveness or the, the uh, you know, encouraging entrepreneurship in, in this. And uh, so Scotland apparently has it in their constitution or their kind of act of parliament that they're to um, get their, you know, 100 million euro per year budget and have it matched to bring in tier ones and enterprises and have them all come together to develop these sort of different industries and, and opportunities that are going to link all the modes of transportation on a on a platform and there are a number of different platforms I mean we're also working with Finland and Sweden that have different approaches to those platforms but basically to say how can this platform enable this multimodal door-to-door -door system so it's supported by national government it's um, it's developed within cities and tested within cities in Scotland 
and then it's going to be many of the different elements of it are going to be developed for export and developed with even some multinational tier ones. So to me, that business model is just bringing so many different things together. And from my perspective, what I what I love about it the most, and this is why I'm in this, is that um, it's goal based. It's like how what are the kinds of things we need to be achieving in this world? How do how are we going? How are we going to live? What are our goals in this region? What, what, do, what, what problems do we need to address? Therefore, what kinds of innovations do we need to develop? As opposed to, we have this industry, how are we going to tweak these things and put them out in a different way? And that's really a stark comparison, but, you know, and I really value the idea of um, building with what's there. And that's what we do. We sort of look at what's there and say, okay, what can we enhance and what can we make better? But I think in terms of how the, the business model has moved from something, I, I can choose between a bus or a car into I can choose between one mode of transportation or a whole on-demand a set of options that means I don't even have to own anything. I can get around whenever I want, and it's all seamless and um, flexible. And very briefly, how's Detroit doing, just to go back to Rosie? Well, I was going to say, it is fantastic lately. I mean, the mood has just changed. The soul of it has just turned around. And I, you know, I can really feel there, the downtown, if you go to the downtown, it's already kind of shifted a fair bit, and mm. a lot more is happening. Got to go visit Susan. Rosie, <laughs> quick ski trail for questions. <laughs> Please do. Could just wait for the microphone so our online audience can hear. Um, Frank Kane from The National, uh, 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 news, newspaper in Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, uh, the whole idea of uh, cities being, being created, you know, uh, uh, most of the great cities of the world began organically almost, you know, satisfy mm. people's economic and human needs, you know, London, Paris, Rome, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, uh, so, and, and for every city that you've mentioned as a great success, it's been recently created, Abu, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Singapore, we have Canberra, we have Brasilia, you know, which, which, which are uh, uh, urban, urban disasters, mm. really. Um, so, you know, I mean, I mean, that's one question. How far can people, uh, you know, artificially create cities? And secondly, it seems that the ones that have been successful uh, have been created in rather undemocratic places. And I'm wondering if a lack of democracy is a prerequisite for <laughs> urban <laughs> success. Mm. It's a good question and a difficult one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the organic, uh, organic versus plan. Indeed. Um, well, uh, let, let's not forget that... Um, um, Nearly all cities that are old or ancient, uh, that have grown organically, uh, started out in authoritarian polities. <laughs> Even London, uh, perhaps not New York. Uh, well, New York under the Dutch, yes, um, and, and others besides. Um, uh, I, I would put it this way, uh, to, 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 try, to make a stab at answering your second point. Um, it depends very much on the stage of development. If, uh, if you're a poor country or city or region, uh, you can grow fast, uh, you can have catch-up growth by getting the basics right, and that can happen under a variety of political systems. Uh, it's happened under some authoritarian systems, but it's also happened under some democratic systems as well. Uh, democratic India uh, got it wrong with growth uh, from independence until the early 1990s, but then that same democratic India has done much better uh, with kick-starting growth once they opened up the economy in the early 1990s and at least got some of the basics uh, more right than they, than they used to do. So um, I, I, it's not to say that authoritarian systems uh, are definitely the best at, uh, at kick-starting this, this uh, type of growth, uh, but it can happen under different political systems. It, the ans my answer, I think, uh, becomes somewhat different when you're talking about growth that depends more on productivity and innovation. In other words, doing new and creative things, as opposed to growth that's about catching up, when you're basically copying what others have done. 
uh, Paul Krugman uh, distinguishes growth by perspiration, which is catch-up growth, you're mobilizing your resources, from growth by inspiration, which is about ideas, the knowledge economy and so on. Now, when it comes to growing through productivity gains, there, I think, uh, liberal democracies have an advantage over others. Um, because the kind of institutions that might deliver catch-up growth are not necessarily going to be the institutions that deliver ideas-based growth. And uh, this is, it's not just a question for many, uh, many uh, states in the Middle East, but also for China. Is China really capable of getting out of this middle income trap and becoming an advanced country with a pretty static Leninist political system? I have my doubts about that. Uh, that system was enormously successful at delivering catch-up growth, but without checks and balances, uh, without openness, without transparency, uh, without a free and open society, can they really deliver the kind of sophisticated growth that we have seen in the West, uh, or even in places like Hong Kong and Singapore, or Japan and South Korea and Taiwan? Uh, and that, uh, that lesson applies to cities as well. Okay, well, time is passing and marching on, and unfortunately we have to draw an end to this session on the future of cities. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for watching us online, and thank you for, for being panellists. This session is now closed. <laughs>